All right, welcome back everyone. Pleased to have you. I'm so excited to turn this over to Dr. Patricia Jones for this uh, third session on the LC of data sharing. Thank you. Um, good afternoon, everyone, and a very warm welcome. As um, it was noted, I'm uh, Patricia Jones. I serve as the director for the Office of Special Populations within the National Institute on Aging. It is my distinct privilege to serve as the moderator for this session. As you can see here, we have a very um, thought-provoking lineup of investigators who graciously agreed to share their experience and their research perspectives in this uh, afternoon segment. Uh, without further ado, I will move quickly to just uh, setting the stage as they've requested uh, to give a little bit of overview of what we're talking about and at the heart of the matter, whom are we talking about? Next slide, please. <clears throat> My remarks will uh, reflect an overview of the uh, ethical, legal, and social implications or issues, why awareness of ELSI is important in conducting high quality research, um, what the value added is in terms of uh, ensuring that we have an eye toward diversity, equity, inclusion, and accessibility, and that we're appropriately integrating this into our activities to be consistent with ELSI and share a few examples of harm that can be caused when research um, does not include ELSI uh, in terms of our top of mind thinking. And then I'll pivot and turn the floor over to our speakers who will share their perspectives and actual use case examples and engage in conversation following that. Next slide, please. So I recognize that we've had a full house today. We have well over 500 people registered and a very strong showing of 208 still online. And I'm mindful that not everyone uh, is in this space every day. Data science um, reflects a broad range of people who have interests uh, that are very different. Just as a level setting exercise, when you hear us refer to Elsie, we're talking about ethical, legal, social issues. This is not a new topic. Uh, it's a phrase that uh, grew of, of increasing popularity in the late 80s. You've heard our colleagues uh, throughout the day make reference to the Human Genome Project or NHGRI. We give full recognition and acknowledgement to Dr. James Watson and colleagues who in 1990 uh, was the first lead of this initiative and really uh, brought forward elucidating the importance of how these findings from different activities may impact not only the individuals who generously agreed to participate in research, but their family members, as well as um, populations that are, are shared characteristics and society as a whole. This topic is also uh, discussed, as you might imagine, in a very broad global arena. It's not uh, unique or specific to the domestic research activities. And in um, 1994, there was a framework established uh, by the European Union that uh, addressed ELSA with an A on aspects. <clears throat> and the, the purpose there, as I perceive, is that it's really provided an opportunity to further explore different components that one might consider in doing um, ethical, legal research and social research with an eye toward the competition and the workforce and other characteristics around validation that uh, research teams might want to take into account. But as you would imagine, over the years, the vocabulary and the perspectives grow and evolve as we learn from our, our ongoing research activities and findings. And the vocabulary now includes uh, responsible research innovation or RRI. The intent uh, there is to more broadly be inclusive of social and economic impacts and to take those into account. And as the, the body of work continues to grow in that direction, there is a peer review journal, the Journal of Responsible Innovation that uh, welcomes submissions on this type of work. Next slide, please. <clears throat> With that in mind, as we've... Um, We'll hear from our speakers uh, slated for this afternoon, the importance of ethics, uh, legal uh, and social issues to take into account. I arguably would also say that um, juxtaposed with Elsie is the importance of why we have to have diversity, equity, inclusion and accessibility at top of mind as we're engaging in planning, implementing 
and um, distilling the findings and results of research projects. From a workforce perspective, there's literature that supports diverse groups published more and are cited more frequently, that diverse team members have particular skills and expertise that are complementary to one another. From a health disparities perspective, uh, those disparities may be identified by team members more readily who possess diverse skills. And from an industry perspective, we also see literature that supports diverse teams are more capable of addressing different market segments that share demographics uh, with the team members. From a quality of science perspective, we also see literature that uh, shows us lack of representation compromises our ability to generalize clinical research findings. And that's at the end of the day, what we want to do, be able to generalize findings so that all benefit from the discoveries and the work being conducted. We also see literature that supports lack of representation can be very expensive as we add time to clinical trials, as we uh, have to pause or add additional team members down the road. All of those add additional costs to the bottom line. We also have literature that supports that lack of representation further exacerbates and compounds the disparities in the populations that we know are, have been historically marginalized from research and are underrepresented in our clinical and our behavioral trials. And I'll just close on this point by uh, further commenting that lack of representation becomes a pathway for undermining trust. Trust in the science that's being conducted, trust in the research enterprise as a whole, and trust in the scientists that are bringing forward information. Next slide, please. So as we um, embark on a conversation related to LC, here are just a couple of points to consider um, as you're thinking through. Of course, today we're talking about Alzheimer's uh, disease and Alzheimer's related dementias, but I, I open uh, for the audience and encourage you to think about research more broadly as these are topical uh, issues that are very germane to every disease condition across the board that NIH and other agencies are very much committed to resolving. Um, but one, of the, one point to share is the importance of privacy, security, our ability to verify, um, handling information in a confidential manner, and of course, data safety. In addition, appropriate and complete informed consent and assent are essential tools and processes that further uh, promote and support LC. We should be mindful of unfair bias. And also, um, as we're looking at conceptualizing and developing new projects and initiatives, be mindful of the alignment of values, attitudes, and beliefs research teams and investigators may have that may differ from those of the very participants we hope to better engage and represent in our science and our study samples. And to that end, be mindful of mutual benefit. How is this work intended to benefit not just the team or the organization or the funding organization for that matter, but the actual community members as a whole? Data ownership, as well as accessibility, who has the right to share? How often do you share going forward? Is there a time limit or is there a forever uh, agreement um, as well as transparency, traceability? And as we will see in a few moments, we talk about um, artificial intelligence and machine learning algorithms, the ability to touch upon explainability and to be able to identify how uh, a, an AI algorithm landed on a particular topic. Next slide, please. So this is important uh, because uh, as we see in the literature and there continues to be a number of, of reports that uh, remind us in the absence of thoughtful and intentional engagement with individuals and populations who are directly impacted by the research, harm has been and can be done. And as noted in my uh, last slide, medical mistrust has been a longstanding uh, issue that continues to further uh, the divide in our ability to appropriately engage 
And we certainly want our research findings to be accurate and to characterize historically marginalized groups effectively and correctly. Next slide, please. These are just a few examples of harm. Uh, the Pew uh, article here speaks to uh, an epic sepsis model that uh, incorrectly uh, missed several hard to reach patients in a very large healthcare system. The second is an example of colorectal cancer that was missed by uh, not correcting for race. And the third is another uh, article from the New England Journal of Medicine that actually pulls data from several different medical disciplines, urology, cardiology, nephrology, and others, all demonstrating where uh, clinical judgment was influenced by inaccurate uh, perceptions made by the algorithms that were using race. Next slide, please. So with that in mind, I'll just close by saying we do have a few resources. Some of you may be very much engaged in these activities. We've also shared with the uh, planning committee uh, a bibliography if should you be interested in reading further. Uh, and I will now pivot and turn to our next speaker to begin the conversation. Uh-oh, I think we went a little too far. So I will uh, call on Dr. Griswold to open with our comments. Is uh, Dr. Griswold on? He is here. Okay, Mike, if you can come off mute. Well, I'm not seeing him able to come off mute. I know he was teaching a course today, um, so we can pivot. Uh, I see Dr. Manson, you are with us and ready to go. If you'd be so kind, I'm happy to turn the virtual floor to Dr. Spiro Manson, who is the Distinguished Professor of Public Health and Psychiatry at the University of Colorado and serves as the Director of the Centers for American Indian and Alaska Native Health. Um, and Dr. Manson, please, uh, with all due, uh, go right ahead and begin. Thank you, Dr. Jones. Well, Ani Buju, in the words of my people, welcome, and it's nice to be with you today. I'm Little Shell Chippewa from the Turtle Mountain Reservation, in addition to my other professional affiliations. The phrase that one often hears in the context of whether it be about ADRD research with our elders and family members and Native communities, but broadly, as Dr. Jones anticipated, is nothing about us without us is really at the heart of meaningful engagement of tribal communities in research. Next slide, please, Carolyn. So there is actually a substantial history that many of my colleagues, as well as the general public, are unaware of with respect to presidential and thus federal uh, recognition of the important and unique relationship between federally recognized tribes and their uh, tribally derived entities um, with respect to research and policy. Uh, the first began with Presidents Reagan and George W.H. Bush in recognition about the importance and the centrality of federal American Indian Alaska Native policies of this nature and reaffirming something called government to government relationships, uh, at the heart of which is the notion of tribal sovereignty. And indeed, in the recent uh, Breken um, Holland uh, Supreme Court uh, decision we saw um, released last week, we saw that notion of tribal sovereignty ratified once again. Next slide, please. There's a particular reason why, and I'll trace the course of this emerging and evolving relationship between the federal government and tribal communities, and it stems from at least two major signal events that occurred in American and Alaska Native communities. The first is referred to as the uh, barrel alcohol study. It was uh, precipitated by a report entitled the Nupiat Economics and Alcohol in Alaskan uh, North Slope. It was released simultaneously at a conference in uh, in Washington, D.C. It was conduct a study conducted by the Institute of Man from Tulane University. And the findings there that were reported resulted in the uh, following headlines you see here. Prominent among them was the New York Times uh, headline uh, that uh, characterized that alcohol plagues Indians. And we saw that, in fact, uh, the uh, Inupiat of Barrow were characterized as a population of alcoholics. Uh, next slide, please. 
the consequences of that actually were really substantial because the city of Barrow, Al uh, Barrow Alaska, as a consequence, uh, their uh, bond ratings went from an A plus to a C plus, and there were literally tens of millions of dollars lost to the economic development of that community, uh, many uh, members of which uh, are and were at that time Alaska Native. And um, the, all the protests, the attempts to rectify the assertions about and the perceptions that Alaska Natives uh, were, uh, were and are alcoholic and thus um, not a particularly good investment, uh, either socially or economically, failed to turn this around. Next slide, please. The second major signal event, um, a little more current in time, uh, it stems from the Havasupai tribe's litigation against Arizona State University, uh, in, wi in which began in 1989. The Havasupai tribe, located at the bottom of the Grand Canyon, agreed um, to be participate in research with Arizona State University and provided biospecimens as well as uh, personal health information. Um, it was at presented as a study of diabetes uh, among those members and with promises of insights that would be rendered that could inform subsequent treatment and prevention. Um, uh, there uh, were a series of publications and subsequently broader uh, access provided to those data that resulted in a series of explosive events. Next slide, please, Carolyn. Um, that, in fact, led to the Havasupai tribe uh, suing Arizona State University, and ultimately, rather than going to court, ASU settled out of court with the uh, Havasupai tribe. But I cannot uh, e even begin to capture the affect and emotional um, consequences of this particular violation of trust with the Havasupai tribe. It reverberated throughout uh, that tribe and indeed Indian country so that in fact today, um, the Navajo Nation is just beginning to reconsider uh, the conduct of genetic research among its tribal members. Um, and we are uh, laboring against the consequences of these negative uh, effects of uh, the violation of such uh, trust. Next slide, please. Now, in an attempt, um, uh, subsequently, to clarify the federal and tribal relationships with particular emphasis on research, we saw in the Clinton administration, Executive Order 13084 actually reaffirm the government-to-government -government relationship and the necessary procedural steps that any federally sponsored effort should take uh, in uh, co a consultation with uh, federally recognized tribes. Next slide, please. Uh, this was then gave birth to a, a flurry of institutional review boards uh, that have had um, multiple responsibilities beyond the simply chartered duties of institutional review boards to include also community review uh, approval uh, and access to the communities and annual review of the products that are generated by the, uh, the research uh, that uh, is undertaken uh, in, within their respective jurisdictions and communities. And so you can see here some of the major uh, IRBs of the Navajo Nation, the Iguala Sioux Tribe, the Northwest Portland Area Indian Health Board, the Cherokee Nation, Chickasaw, Choctaw, many others have set the standard for the um, nature and extent of, of the consideration both for human subject protection as well as access and subsequent dissemination of any products generated by such work. Next slide, please. Next slide, thank you. This particular effort was further expanded and, um, and reinforced by uh, George W. Bush uh, and in fact, um, our senior senator at the time, um, Ben Nighthorse Campbell, was instrumental in working with um, President Bush and his advisors, particularly in DHHS, to reaffirm and to expand the nature of the federal obligation to tribal uh, communities in terms of this broad consultation proce process, but also with a special emphasis on uh, research. Next slide, please. 
That was further advanced by um, President um, Barack Obama uh, in a special memorandum on tribal consultation that issued from his office. Uh, and he was one of the first uh, presidents to ever visit. Uh, and spend two and a half days in this particular case in the Standing Rock Reservation that spans the North and South Dakota borders and um, had a very special uh, presence uh, in these kinds of negotiations and in the hearts and minds of Native people. Next slide, please. But probably most important out of uh, President Obama's visit and this long history of presidential recognition, acknowledgement, and commitments to the consultation process, we saw the Department of Health and Human Services begin a very con concentrated effort to develop specific consultation policies and procedures uh, and practices for engaging uh, tribal uh, communities about research particularly, all the way from the development of a handbook um, and, and the development of a tribal uh, health research office within uh, then uh, Dr. Francis Collins office um, at NIH. Next slide, please. So I want to share with you today, I think, three sets of dramatic um, points of reference that emerge in the search for a common ground between the Fed, among the federal government, the uh, universities, and the investigators who propose uh, to pursue research uh, in partnership with tribal communities and our tribal communities themselves. And I break these out in terms of organizational, political, and cultural differences between uh, and among those entities. Um, so that, for example, uh, and that in many of our research-intensive universities in the federal government, you see that decision-making is largely hierarchical and typically rule-driven. The process emphasizes efficiency, replicability, and written documentation. Leadership is highly formalized and centralized, and it's often without reference to context. Analytic thinking is prominent. It assumes for the most part that there is an answer, a desirable and singular answer to whatever questions may arise. This stands in sharp contrast to similar kinds of dynamics within tribal communities where decision-making is often horizontal. It's frequently precedent-oriented, and it's almost always consensual in nature. The process is fluid, iterative, it's often recorded and noted orally and benchmarked by key events. Leadership is shared, diffused, and ascribed rather than attributed. Uh, the emphasis is on a distributive uh, uh, cognition and thinking about research, its relevance, priority, and the extent to which a tribal community will support it. And it assumes that there may be multiple answers to the very same question. And ultimately authority, the, um, the, the location of agreement um, to proceed is a matter of collective decision-making. Next slide. With respect to political differences, there are two stark and dramatic um, points of difference between these two sets of entities. And among research intensive universities in the federal government, representation is for the most part on a collective of individuals, of constituents. Uh, the objective is to govern or to control individuals or groups thereof. The confidence stems largely from delegated authority and administrative license uh, to assert control over a variety of processes and procedures. Accountability is couched in terms of blameworthiness and liability, and obedience is um, sought through instruction and regulatory compliance. And this stands again in sharp contrast to tribal communities where representation is of an individual collective, of the body politic, if you will, the tribe itself. The objective is to manage appropriately the interdependent relationships that characterize tribal communities. Authority is rooted in a moral and social responsibility, not in some kind of abstract um, framework. Accountability is framed in terms of obligation, mutual responsibility, and acceptance by others. And ultimately, conformity uh, is sought through adherence to shared values among those who are the principal um, participants. Next slide, please. And then ultimately, there are clear cultural differences between uh, the non-tribal and the tribal world. So that, for example, uh, many scientists, universities tend to adopt a very person-centric uh, perspective. They prize privacy and anonymity. They emphasize majority opinion. 
They're frequently goal-directed and value problem-solving, and they really perceive time as a precious commodity that is limited and to be managed. In tribal communities, it's quite different. It's, the tribal communities are typically sociocentric rather than person-centric. We seek co cooperation and we de-emphasize conflict. We stress mutuality, belonging, solidarity. We tolerate differences uh, and we encourage common vision. Next slide, please. There are a number of implications for and uh, points of tension that arise out of this uh, that are uh, apparent in the Belmont report. They have to do with respect for persons, beneficence, and justice. Next slide, please. Um, they entail the review and approval of research, the distribution of resources, the manner of informed consent, as Dr. Jones anticipated, the nature and extent of accountability and control, data ownership and sharing, and requirements for continued collaboration. Next slide, please. This does not mean that we cannot reach data use agreements between tribal entities and research intensive universities and scientists. These are just three examples of dozens that now we and our partners have negotiated over the last decade. I'm deeply involved in the All of Us Research Program as a co-chair of the Tribal uh, Collaboration Work Group and moving forward and developing frameworks and specific instances of such uh, data use agreements. I'm also an MPI on the Aim Ahead initiative, doing this with AI and ML and, and promoting the understanding of the perspectives, constraints, and obligations of the partners with respect to those uh, particular agendas. Next slide, please. I'm impressed that we have a number of recent examples of how to successfully navigate these differences politically, culturally, and organizationally among them. A number of the advances within NIH in terms of the Tribal Health Research Office, the Tribal Advisory Council, uh, and the like uh, are pieces of that puzzle. Next slide, please. So I just want to end by noting that there are a number of documents that I would strongly recommend to you that are meaningful and informed by these kinds of relationships with a very specific focus on research among the federal government, scientists, and tribal communities. Next slide, please. And um, lastly, culminating in the January 23rd, 2023 data management sharing policy, which I would direct your attention to, that there are specific points throughout that um, policy and those procedures that take into account exactly the issues that I've highlighted here and that provide best practices for how to proceed in engaging tribal communities in research of this nature. Last slide, please. And I'll just leave with you a number of publications relevant to my remarks today that I would encourage you uh, to review as a point of departure as you're seeking to engage our people in your work. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Manson. Uh, your remarks were so thought-provoking and really helpful and very timely. Um, we're going to keep track of all the questions by uh, using the Slido as well as the chat. I see Dr. Griswold as, as with us. He had a technical glitch, um, but we are super excited that you're able to join. And I will quickly now turn the floor over to you to make commentary on uh, DEIA and ecosystems for data. Thank you very much, Patricia. And I am going to try sharing my screen. And uh, if this crashes and uh, goes all crazy, then I'll log back in. We can go to the third speaker and I'll come back uh, and, and just uh, turn on my video or something. Uh, like can you see my screen? Uh, not yet. You're, it says you're starting to share. OK, great. Let me know when. You're, I can see the slides from my side, but it says uh, double click to enter full screen mode. Oh boy. Well, okay. You're back with us. Um, as a backup, uh, do we have your slides? And, and maybe that might be easier to just move forward. I know you wanted to advance. We do have his slides. Uh, I think he wanted to do a demonstration. I know, I, but that may be what's crashing us. Yes, yes. Um, Dr. Griswold, if you're still with us, we can move forward with what we have. Okay, I do okay. not have a If not, it's slides. okay, Dwayne. If not, um, we can move to um, 
our next speaker and give him a moment to come back on. Yeah, I don't, I don't hear him. So uh, we will move to Dr. Ono Machado. Um, Lucilla, thank you so very much. I see you are poised and ready to go. We're super excited that you're able to join this afternoon. Dr. Ono Machado serves as professor at Yale University in a newly minted department uh, dedicated to data science and bioinformatics. Uh, and we are super excited to hear your thoughts and perspectives on what we should be paying attention to. So I will turn the floor over to you. Uh, thank you so much. And, and I, I sent my slides. Yes. And I apologize that I did have some animation, but, but it's very simple and, and uh, it's just like keep clicking. That's that. fine. Are we able to pull up Dr. Machado's slides? There we go. Perfect. Thank you. Great. Thank you. So again, th thanks the organizers for the invite and, uh, and I'll try to be brief on my remarks here. In the next slide, uh, I go back to what HIPAA defines as the identified data, which is either an expert determination that there's very small risk that um, anticipated recipient could identify individuals or the safe harbor approach, which is the removal of 18 identifiers such as dates, biometrics, names, et cetera. Keeping in mind that when dates are included, uh, we are typically talking not anymore of the identifying data, but of limited data sets, which are typically um, exchanged with, with data use agreements. So the next slide, we have this uh, clinical data sharing dilemma that is it right to share since people have not been explicitly asked about their electronic health records being shared and they don't know who is sharing what. Is it right not to share because new discoveries and acceleration of science depend on sharing and we saw uh, as, as much during the pandemic. Um, also, can we share without moving data around? That is, can we give access but not necessarily uh, have people download data sets? Can we ask people what they want? Is it practical and is it fair? So in the next slide, we are uh, going through very briefly a technical challenge of data de-identification. Uh, next. So combinations of values can identify people. So uh, I was talking about biometrics not being included because you can have a situation like this in which you share the, the gray table. Obviously you don't share identifiers such as the names of people, but uh, let's say the biometric is a fingerprint and you have a person of interest and you have that person of interest's fingerprint, then you can simply go to, a, let's say this is a public data set, match the fingerprint with the row and then read out the other characteristics of the person. So you bridge the privacy of that person of interest, which is why biometrics are not um, allowed and, and they are identifiers. Now, if you click again, you will see that instead of biometrics, let's say you have two uh, features, uh, variable A, variable B, and there happens to be unique combinations that you happen to know of your person of interest, Lisa, that A equals 10 and B equals 20, and you know that she is in that particular data set. So using the same strategy as before, you just match the person of interest and read out the remainder of the table. So if you click again, there is also a situation in you don't even need to have a unique combination of A and B that you know of the person because you can reach, for example, uh, you can see the diagnosis is the same for these two people and then you narrow the income as being between 20 and 60. So several techniques that existed before based on anonymity up to a certain number of rows being uh, exactly the same, they, they, they actually don't apply because you can still uh, breach privacy in different ways. So in here, we put this red line, meaning you know something that is on the left-hand side, and then you read out the things that you didn't know that are on the right-hand side. So in the next slide, you will see also that de-identified data when linked 
uh, they increase the chances that you'll be able to match the information you know. So on the right hand side is the information that I had before. Let's say that's study one. On the left hand side is study two. And we want to link uh, these individuals on the two tables. And uh, we obviously don't uh, disclose identifiers. And instead, we hash those identifiers into a unique ID that cannot be reversed back to the names of the people. So in a way, they are de-identified. So you use the same function on the two studies. And there's, that's the so-called um, privacy-preserving record linkage through hash IDs in which you aligned the rows. And you know, uh, first row is from the same individual and has uh, these characteristics. So the moment you link, and it's typically done by a third party, uh, you see that you have a more complete record, which is good, but also you allow more combinations to be unique or to be identifiable. So if before you only knew A, but you, you didn't know B, perhaps you couldn't uh, get to the person of interest. But imagine you, you know A and, and you knew C that is from another data set and now you can uh, use the same strategy to read out the role that you're interested in. So as you can see, uh, the more you link, the more identifiable or re-identifiable the data set will be. So next slide. There are privacy protect, protection solutions, and I, I put them in quotes because they're just mitigation strategies. And I'll briefly talk about institution and people-centric ones and then data-centric ones. So in the institution, you can be a data broker and only allow disclosure of data to certain parties, and this happens all the time. Uh, we also experimented with patient-defined data sharing permissions in the consent management system. And then for this two types of institution and people-centric approaches, we explore blockchain um, ledger and smart contracts in order to ascertain that there is no tampering with the records or who access the records. And also uh, the records are delivered in a format that was uh, permitted. And both institution and uh, people-centric as well as data-centric solutions need to be coupled with privacy policies. Otherwise uh, they won't work by themselves. So the next slide you will see uh, is a slide by uh, Dr. Brad Malling from Vanderbilt. Uh, and Vanderbilt uh, manages the Data Research Center for the All of Us program. And in this case, it is um, a registered, they have three tiers, aggregate counts, which is a public tier, a registered tier, and a controlled tier. Uh, they are all uh, still, don't have identifiers, but they are very well protected for the reasons that I presented in the slides before. So it, it is an important um, cohort uh, to, to watch uh, for and, and also see the uh, privacy measures that are being done there. The next slide. Uh, the next, please. Uh, shows how we do things these days. And if you click, um, click the slide, please. There are uh, there is an emphasis on healthcare institutions as brokers right now, and then yeah, click one more. Oops. Um, so in that slide, we showed that the institution as a broker uh, is what we do these days, but we can also play with uh, the not play. I would say experiment with having patients as the ones consenting to particular use of their data. So hopefully we can get back to the slides. Yes, thank you so much. And uh, I, I was fortunate to be able to implement this uh, in my previous institution in which we did uh, put the set of permissions chosen by the patients for particular items on top of a clinical data warehouse. So the next slide, shows uh, that the system uh, uh, illustrates the, an interface in which per item you would select which are the recipients of the data, local institution, nonprofit institutions, or for-profit institutions for each data item 
that was um, uh, published uh, before as probably being uh, considered sensitive. So the next slide quickly is the kind of results uh, uh, of that uh, experiment in which in on the right hand side in light blue, you see that approximately 50% of the people per item are okay in the way that we're um, doing the permissions today that the institutions take care of it. On the very extreme left hand side in red, you will see uh, the percent of people who declined, who did not want to share a particular item. I put circles about family history uh, because interestingly, all the four items there uh, were uh, declined at more than 10%. Uh, and in the middle, you see in purple, uh, people who wanted the data to be shared only with uh, the local institution. In, in orange, those who would be okay with that as well as uh, nonprofit institutions. So you can see approximately 50% of the time we're doing the right thing per item, but uh, you do see that uh, some people don't want to share a particular item. So the next slide is just an expansion of the one before with two institutions and the patterns were approximately the same. With the majority of patients wanting to share data, uh, except that some of them only with the local institutions, uh, same order as before. Uh, the others with nonprofit and on the right-hand side, dark green with the way we're doing today. Uh, so we've got uh, the system of, of permissions, again, is, is individualized and it has pros and cons um, that I can comment on as we go along. The next slide, uh, I will go a, a little bit on the data-centric solutions as well, because those are named privacy technology, and they do constitute some other mitigation strategies uh, to try to make the data less identifiable. So federated computation is when, again, you don't share the data, but you do permit some uh, access to it so that you can do federated analysis or distributed analytics. You compute with lots of data sets that uh, live in their own enclaves somewhere, uh, but you never put them all together. And by, do, by not doing that, you um, decrease the chances that someone breaches into one central repository and get all the data or do uh, more explorations in there. Another technique is to add noise to the data. And one of the main uh, exemplars of that is a technique called differential privacy. And, and yet another one, is to encrypt the data and operate on encrypted data so you never decode or uh, unencrypt that data and operate in what's called clear text. And again, none of them completely protects privacy, but they make it more difficult to uh, re-identify individuals. And again, all of them are coupled with privacy policies. So the next slide, is an example of uh, horizontal partitions. You have two hospitals with different data sets and you want to uh, compute with this federated uh, analysis. Uh, if you click again, you see on the right-hand side, uh, vertical partitions in that situation of linkage that I, I told you about that perhaps doesn't need to happen. You can still compute with data that remains separated in two uh, different rep uh, repositories, but yes, you need to align them so you can do the analysis in that format. And there are several algorithms that, that can be done that way. The next slide shows uh, an, an example that was done during the COVID-19 data discovery. Uh, next slide, please. In which uh, several institutions, including the National VA, including uh, also an institution in Germany, uh, decided to we needed clinical answers to, to uh, hospitalize patients and, and no one knew much about the, pen, uh, the SARS CoV 2 at the time or COVID 19, uh, better handling of patients. And we decided to do a distributed analysis and answer some questions this way. So in early 2020, we put together and we could um, compute on those data. For example, were ACE, uh, ACE inhibitors safe? For hypertensive patients, yes or no, and, and ended up uh, 
being, yes, they are pretty safe, and this was confirmed later on, but it was information uh, that was good to have early on, so clinicians could add accordingly. And because data were distributed and they didn't have to be centralized, we could have 45 million patients for comparisons, those with uh, non COVID-19 or non-hypertensive uh, and so on. So it was a rich way to go about the data. Uh, the next slide goes also about another form of distributed computing that we're doing right now with the Million Veteran Program and the All of Us Research Program in which we developed secure federated algorithms. And this is Dr. Hong Cho, currently at the Broad Institute and, and soon joining us at Yale, who uh, developed secure and federated GWAS analysis and um, is doing a lot of research in this combination of distributed analytics plus encryption. Uh, the next uh, slide shows an example of uh, how we use blockchain and automated smart contract infrastructure to support multi-site transaction recording and data redaction. Again, with patients uh, electing what they wanted to share in each one of the particular institutions that they have seen, we mounted uh, this consent registry in which also it was recorded um, who can get what, and, and again, any operations uh, transactions get immutably recorded in a ledger. Uh, powered by blockchain technology. This is a slide by Dr. Tim Kuo from uh, University of California, San Diego. Uh, the next slide is uh, an example of differential privacy, an example of survival analysis, a slide by Dr. Luca Bonomi from Vanderbilt. And uh, the key thing to notice is differential privacy is a, a technique that adds noise to the data so to make it harder to re-identify. And in doing so, it also provides a certain quantifiable guarantee that the data, the, the record will not be re-identifiable. And uh, there's a very elegant solution. Uh, however, it, it, it's practical in certain conditions, but not in others. What we see here is just an example on the original distribution on the left-hand side in blue, and then perturbed or the distribution with noise added. And then uh, two uh, Kappelmeier sets of, of curves, seeing that the patterns are, are pretty much um, the same. So the next slide is a slide by Dr. Xiaoshan Zheng from University of Texas. And it's the last one that, that I wanna present as a privacy technology solution, which uh, deals with homomorphic encryption. And it, it's, a, it's a big name. And what it really means is you encrypt the data and then you develop solutions that are allowed to compute with that encrypted data without ever decrypting the data. And again, that does offer some uh, more difficulty in re-identifying the data because you never have the unencrypted. Hi, Dr. Um, Ochanada. We yeah. gotta we gotta um, move on to the next speaker. Yeah. Thank so you. Th that was the last slide. We appreciate your sharing the um, real experiences you've had in managing these difficult topics, um, and I'm certain there'll be plenty of questions related to this point. Um, Dr. Griswold is back with us. We have his slide deck and we will advance for him. Appreciate that, Patricia. Go right ahead. Thank you very much. And I apologize for the technical difficulties. Uh, as Patricia said, I'm, I'm teaching a class in Baltimore right now. Uh, so I'm, I guess the internet is hanging on by a thread. I'm not even gonna turn my video on. Um, so I'm, I'm gonna talk about uh, establishing an ecosystem, fostering diversity, equity, inclusion, and accessibility. And I'm gonna try to, to describe how the uh, DEI principles connect fair and trust principles to open principles. And next slide, please. Fantastic. Uh, Patricia asked us to include a positionality statement. So very quickly, uh, who am I? The age old question. I was born in Alaska, so I still love hiking the mountains. You can see that over on the right. Uh, I did grad school at Johns Hopkins, Epping Biostats of Aging training grant. I joined there as a faculty and directed the Biostats Center at Hopkins for a while. I met my incredible wife, who's a geriatrician epidemiologist. Uh, we had two boys. She's from Mississippi originally, so now I'm in Mississippi. 
uh, where I founded the uh, de uh, Department of Data Science and established MS and PhD programs in data science at UMC. And along the way, somehow I got black belts in Taekwondo. Currently, I'm a professor and director of the Mind Center's Science Evidence and Technology uh, Corps, and I'm the PI of the BLSI Fair and Open Data Project. So that's kind of, that's where my perspective comes from, from a lot of these things. Next slide, please. Um, balancing the individual and the collective. Trisha asked us uh, to kind of have this run through. It's a great theme for diversity and ecosystems. I'm a statistician, so the quote on the left, I love Sherlock Holmes. In the aggregate, everybody's a mathematical certainty to me. I can see with precision what the average person will do, but and the individual person, they're a little bit more unsolvable. Uh, and I got to balance that, though, with what my wife thinks about. Like, the good physician treats the disease. The great physician will treat the patient who has the disease. And so this is a balance of this individual and the collective. And I'll try to have this a theme run through my, uh, my, my slides. Next, uh, advanced slide, please. Thank you. Uh, uh, David Kent in a PCORI webinar uh, had this great little thing where he talked about treating the average person. And, if you see the person in the middle there, that's not a real person. That is a computer algamation of all of the people around that middle person. And what you see there, his point was that it kind of looks like all of those individual actual people, but it doesn't really look like any of them or represent them. Uh, and that's a, a thing that often clinicians have to take into account. Advanced slide. Uh, my wife often will see one of her patients and try to talk through treatment strategies with them and some other questions are often, okay, well, so you have this study that says the treatment works. Were people like me in the study? And what were their results? And that becomes a place where, how do we show people um, answers to those questions? Uh, next slide, please. Oh, I'm sorry. Efforts to, so key point, one of my key points, efforts to foster diversity often will start with transparency to be able to answer some of these questions. All right, next slide. Uh, transparency, I had this fantastic interactive visualization for you guys. Uh, it was a political one, so always kind of fun, uh, uh, non-polarizing at all, right? This is on the voting habits of Americans like you. And it was done by the New York Times. They have fantastic interactive visuals there. Uh, the, the goal of transparency, the actual technical definition over on the left part of the slide, is the quality of allowing light to pass through so you can see the objects behind distinctly, right? So often we'll have an overall result that we get from some study or a treatment, a clinical trial, something like that. And the key thing is, can we see what's underlying that overall aggregated results? This uh, Voting Habits of Americans Like You was fantastic. Their, their, their specific audience, I'm sorry, their specific message was to show that there's at least as much heterogeneity geographically in uh, how we vote as there is between races. Um, and this was done on the 2012 um, election, uh, presidential election. So they broke down the overall results of who voted and how often they voted. And, and uh, uh, the, to the right in these plots is how much they voted Democratic. And to the left is how much Republican. The, uh, I, I would have taken you through this fantastic interactive visual if uh, the internet had allowed me, but I'll just talk through it. The big red pink dot is uh, whites. The green is uh, African-Americans. And the yellows and the um, purples are uh, Asians and Indian Americans, I believe. Um, so you can see that there's some, some differences there by race. But then they said, well, yeah, let's break it out by education. And you see that those circles, that aggregated information, the average person is then broken out more. And then if you break it up by race and by age, and that last one down there, look how diverse things are if you include geography as well. 50 times the number of cells broken down by race, education, and sex. And so to answer the question, where do the overall results come from? All right, who won the election? Why did they win the election? That transparency of what happened often requires an accessibility. I find this very ironic in the fact that I can't access this uh, lovely visual I'd love to show you. But um, so that, that's a, a key point. Each of my slides or most of them have this key point on there. Transparency is important for diversity. Transparency requires accessibility. Uh, next slide, please. So uh, that's great for politics, but we're, we are health researchers, right? So could we do something similar with a health kind of outcome? So uh, most people know the SPRINT trial. It's, it's pretty famous by now, about 9,000 people. Primary outcome is CBD, a uh, bunch of exclusions. The investigators had some a priori specified biologically plausible things that were personal characteristics that they wanted to look at, like age and sex and race. 
CKD, CBD, and, and, and other things. Um, next slide, please. We'll go very quickly through here. I also had this wonderful interactive plot I was going to show you using the sprint data to show that individual versus collective transparency with a, a, a interactive visual similar to that uh, um, political one that we just looked at where my wife's patient, let's say, is an 80-year-old woman with African ancestry who uh, is non-smoker, has a BMI of 26, and, and no previous related history. And her question is, were people like me in the sprint trial? And what were their results? And so uh, we can we can show, actually, through interactive visualizations, technology. Uh, 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 again, it's not nearly as cool or fun just to look at it on the slide, but I can basically break down each of those, the, the primary results of standard versus intensive blood pressure uh, from, from a seven and a five, seven percent CBD rate on standard versus five on intensive. Okay, we'll break it down by age. And does it look similar? Break it up by sex. And you see the bubbles there breaking out as I include more and more and more individual characteristics until I can get as close as possible to that individual person who's sitting right there in front of me asking me, should I go on this new treatment? And uh, if I did that, there's a lot less information. There's like 16 people who went on the standard treatment who looks just like the patient in front of me. And there's only nine in the intensive treatment. But the nice part here is that at least the results here in Sprint uh, uh, are, are in line with what the overall results are, like that balance of the individual and collective. With additional technology, we don't just have to rely on, well, what was the, what was the overall results? What is the aggregate, the average person? So technology can help to show us how diverse individuals aggregate to overall outcomes. Next slide, please. My next question is, well, how are we doing in individual studies? So SPRINT was pre-specified to look at diverse populations. And therefore, I can do that slide that I just showed you. It has 60% white, it has 30% black, non-Hispanic. It has 11% Hispanic. How about uh, a hot off the presses study? Next uh, advanced slide, please. How about Lecanemab? Lecanemab hot off the presses June 9th, 11 days ago, gave the FDA panel. They uh, approved it unanimously based on the company showing a 27% less decline in global cognition from the lecanemab versus the placebo groups, a 0.5 difference in CDR at month 18. The, the results vary all, all the way over to, to the, the right. In addition, advanced slide, please. The company showed a safety issues of two to 50 times the adverse event rates in amyloid related uh, imaging abnormalities for hemorrhage and edema, specifically focused also on homozygous ApoE4 groups. And you see the, those red numbers in the lecanemab over there, especially looking at 33% of homozygous ApoE4 carriers for edema versus 4% in the placebo group. That's a, that's a, a big difference in adverse events. Uh, next slide, please. What does this have to do with uh, what we're here for today on diversity? Well, if you just Google lecanemab diversity, you will be brought the very first top Google hit leads to the company's investors news release, which states that they had, they used inclusive eligibility criteria and had successful recruitment of diverse and ethnic and racial populations. That's the study standpoint. If you look not at what they presented to the FDA, but way down deep in their PDF of supplementary materials in briefing document table 10, they give what the demographic characteristics of placebo and lecanemab were. And if you see there, on average, they were about 71 years old, 50-50 female, uh, male and female, great. Over three quarters of them were white, two to 3% were black and African-American, and uh, about 70% were Asian, 3% other. Um, how does that really, uh, uh, why is that so worrisome from the results we just saw? Advanced slide, please. Well, we also know that African-Americans from other research are more likely to be ApoE4 carriers especially with the homozygous genotype. The company just said that's the worst uh, the adverse event there, uh, that, that they had. And uh, advanced slide, please. If our question is, am I included? If this is a patient in front of me asking me if they should take lecanemab, we have 20 people in each of these groups to try to do that individual balance with the overall aggregate. There's not enough data to call it here. That's a very difficult question. Uh, advanced slide, please. So. The key here is that in Sprint, it was pre-specified to be di uh, diversity as, a, as an important component. And in the lecanemab, they use quote unquote, inclusive eligibility criteria. Uh, inclusive eligibility criteria could mean we admit anybody. So intentionality for inclusivity is an important concept. Uh, next slide, please. How are we doing in 
individual studies, has been, there's been a lot written about that. How are we doing in data ecosystems? Well, the, again, the, one of the first starting points for diversity is transparency. So how are we doing? Can we find basic information on who's included in our, uh, in all of these fantastic and wonderful data ecosystems that were just presented this morning? So I went, and this is a, a non-complete sample of ecosystems. I'm not gonna be able to click through all these. Um, again, the one minute left. Uh, it, but this is that table in the middle says age, race, geography, and sex. Could you find any information on who was included in these uh, data ecosystems? And it's not a great table necessarily. Uh, there, there's, it's very hard to find just like how many, how many uh, uh, older adults are in there? How many women are in there? Um, one of the key reasons is because it's so focused on genetics. Many of these ecosystems use uh, the, the FASTQ files or, hey, I have, I have 10 terabytes of MRI data. That's great. But if I don't know if those are 10 terabytes of 40-year-old white guys, how do I know if they're appropriate for the study that I'm trying to, to, uh, to conduct? Um, next slide, please. And I will say, I looked around a lot on these. I clicked on everything I could possibly get at. And I know data ecosystems because I create data ecosystems. It was, it, I'm not trying to point the finger and saying like, oh, you guys are doing great. The key thing is just like in trying to get participants into research studies, it takes community. Uh, one of the the, the uh, data ecosystems that were was not shown today, but that we've been working with is, is the Alzheimer's uh, Disease Data Initiative. Uh, the NIA has had a partnership with them. And uh, when I called them up and said, hey, I was supposed to give this talk. Can we de develop some things? Their leaders said, yeah, that's great. That's an important idea. Let's do it. So in terms of the community here, we've got to have that intentionality if we're going to be able to say, yes, I have diverse data that you can come uh, analyze. It comes from community and our community involvements with the people who are creating these data ecosystems. Next slide, please. I'm probably not going to have enough time to go through this one. Uh, Patricia asked us to include a very specific example. I'll just say geography was available in none of those, and it presents specific challenges. But there are ways to include things like the Area Deprivation Index for neighborhood Im uh, impact. Um, and governance models that will help you with those things. Uh, we've developed the BLSA fair and open platform to do that. Uh, next slide, please. As last summary, advanced slide from the individual and collective, we have accessibility and transparency are important and they promote diversity and inclusivity. Next uh, advanced slide. Those come from technology and intentionality. Next slide. That comes from community built platforms, which advanced slide, almost done. Recommendations for individual studies, intentional diversity include uh, social determinants of health. For ecosystems, hide less stuff, use more open access, use pass-through logins, use user-friendly visuals, use people and phenotypes, not the number of petabytes of data you have is available. Next slide, please. My last one. If you didn't know that uh, example person I showed before was uh, my Angelo, fantastic person who, to a, this is her, her uh, one of her famous quotes to a statistician, it's fantastic. If you're always trying to be normal, you're never going to know how amazing you can be. So uh, thank you for the invite to talk. I'm sorry my interactions didn't work, but the slides will go around. I should have links in them. So uh, have some fun, please. Dr. Griswold, that was an absolutely amazing presentation. The order and the flow worked out perfectly as it should have been. And we thank you for sharing your perspectives. We see how amazing your work is. And we now will take um, a few questions. Uh, we've had the opportunity to really explore really important topics, and we want to hear from the audience. Okay, <clears throat> so I see there's a que oh. there's a question related to uh, particular data ecosystem architectures. Uh, feel free to answer as you see them here in Slido. And uh, Dr. Manson, this question might be uh, one you would consider taking. You'll have to direct me. I'm not used to. So. Oh, I know it's a new tool for us. Uh, so this is asking our particular data ecosystem architectures, uh, specifically federated or central um, systems, more or less conducive to protecting the security of data from populations such as American Indian or Alaska Native. Absolutely, and I think our work in Aim Ahead under the, um, the leadership of Paul Avalek at Harvard uh, is a wonderful example. We've identified five different 
models, forgive me, model B is a singular uh, standalone um, example. Uh, and then model D is what we call the, the federated example. And in both of those, the primary concerns are the protection and governance around the data, uh, which rests first and primarily with the tribal entities, whether it's a healthcare organization or a federally recognized tribe that is responsible for the oversight and jurisdiction of those data. But the federated approach allows multiple in relatively independent data sets um, and the governance um, by the collective, but protects the um, the sovereign, um, the data sovereignty of each of the um, jurisdictional authorities of those. So those are two examples, and we're seeing a progression from the individual um, um, architecture to ecosystem, uh, and then developing ways in which. Uh, a number of different entities can come together to address common questions, but in a parallel and independent fashion. Excellent, thank you. Um, the other question here is, what is the role of data infrastructures versus researchers in ensuring data de-identification de in a federated data ecosystem? I think we need to get away with the ensuring data, the identification, because that's not real. Um, but we, we can approach, right? We can do our best. And um, data infrastructures are super important, as, as well as the conduct of researchers, which is why I emphasize that without the policy to go together with the, the this mitigation solutions, uh, there, there can't be um, uh, data sharing that would, you know, uh, be, there, there can't be risk-free data sharing. We just have to manage risk. Thank you. As a, as a quick, uh, I like what in the previous session where somebody said it's both, right? So the, the, the researchers themselves who are putting the data up into ecosystems have a responsibility to try to make sure it's as de-identified as possible. But the infrastructures themselves also have a responsibility there. I think the tension might come in also when we heard, well, we want a big giant cloud infrastructure that connects like Anvil and Biodata Catalyst and all these other ones. Well, if you're gonna connect them, there has to be some kind of ID that crosses all those different ecostructures to, to, to be able to use the data all at once. And that's a tension, right? Because then it becomes, the more data you have, the easier it is to identify someone. Excellent, thank you. Um, and someone asked the question regarding privacy risks, and do you see uh, risk linking from uh, linking data from the same individual through GUIDs? Uh, Whomever's comment, comfortable. <laughs> you can comment quickly that, um, you know, technically when, when you can link, data across is because there is some way to to know you know that this particular um, patient is present or absent it's, therefore the the notion for example that the gdpr puts there that it's impossible to get back to the individual is is really not attainable right so what privacy risks do, do we see from linking data in general? It's it's the one that I mentioned, right? You have more chances of re-identifying because you 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 link, um, uh, you make the record so called longer. Um, and I think that it's an open question today whether people know that their data are being linked, and whether there should or not be consent for linkage. I'll, I'll put a quick uh, caveat on there that I, I agree. I think it's a it's maybe a theoretical risk at this point, though. Uh, for instance, if you saw from my talk, I couldn't even get information on how old people were or what their sex was or what their race was, right? Uh, in, in any in one individual, many of these individual ecosystems. So the, the idea that somehow uh, a, a researcher would go into an ecosystem, find out who you are, go see you on the street or something like that and meet you. 
I think that's pretty unlikely. You know, that, that's that's not going to occur. Uh, maybe um, infinite years in the future if, if Chat GPT does come to rule the world. But for right now, I, I would consider it more of a theoretical risk than than, than others. I, I think the the go from uh, the records and try to you know identify everyone uh, that is there, get their names. It's it's possible, right? Some others have shown that with with uh, certain databases that that it could be done, but. Uh, a person of interest, finding a person of interest in a data set is not a theoretical risk. Thank you. There's a question, um, Dr. Manson, is there guidance on sharing data um, among uh, researchers interested in uh, American Indian and Alaska Native uh, research? There is, and actually the most recent and ongoing experiences in the conduct of the Radix Up initiative, and I saw Warren Kibbe, he's uh, still with us this afternoon. And Warren knows quite well that uh, NIH in the Radix Up initiative is investing substantial resources into doing two things. One, to enhance their CDCC, which is the coordinating center for the Radix Up initiative and their outreach and engagement and uh, continued support of the some 10 to 11 tribal nations grantees that are participating in it. And NIH has also funded or is about to fund yet a separate but hopefully related activity that will establish a tribal data repository, the governance of which will be subject to the participating tribal nations since it's specific to those 10 to 11 tribal nations in the Radix Up initiative they will probably provide the most specific kinds of governance in terms of structure and process. That's the most current and I think um, probably um, instructive example today that has many uh, lessons to be learned. Thank you. That's excellent um, information to know. And I will add uh, that the Tribal Health Research Office at NIH has worked in collaboration with the NIH Office of Science Policy to establish guidelines and uh, uh, use case examples of letters of engagement and other resources for uh, investigators or program officials uh, across the agency who are interested in further collaboration with um, American Indian or Alaska Native um, communities. Uh, in Dr. Addition, Silver- In that regard, the, the, all of us research program has been particularly invested in developing relationships with tribal nations and um, very specific guidelines and outreach and consultation as well. Excellent, thank you, thank you for that. Dr. Silverberg, um, program official with NIA Division of Neuroscience, would you like to ask your question? Thank you so much, sorry, I tried to squeeze it in there. It was, <laughs> had to use some abbreviations that might not make it make sense anymore, but um, I, this was a fantastic session and um, I learned quite a bit um, thank you, Dr. Manson, for explaining all that history. It's really very helpful to put it in context. I actually had a question about the um, the study that was presented with the um, perspectives about decisions to share medical data and biospecimens for research um, that, if I understood correctly, showed that about 50% of people don't want to share with for-profit organizations and I was just wondering, because this is something I've given a lot of thought to, um, for our Alzheimer's disease centers, we you know, ask consent and some places just flat out don't share, the institution doesn't share, or the you know, certain individual researchers don't share with for-profit organizations. And I don't know off the top of my head what proportion of treatments actually come from for profit, but I wonder if that were presented to individuals, if you think that might change that answer or whether we need kind of more information for the general public about how treatments are developed and what's needed to make them speed up and be more yeah. appropriate for individuals. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm totally with you. And I think one major, major limitation that we later, you know, one of those things you say, well, I sh we should have explained that better because for-profit is a lot of different things, right? It's insurance companies, it's uh, pharma companies, but it is, um, you know, social media companies and, and so on. And so I, I, I do agree with you if, if people new, you know, share for the purpose of developing a new drug, 
uh, I think that uh, the results will be different. Nina, this has been a longstanding discussion in the LC arena among American Indian Alaska Native communities, and I know it's shared with other marginalized communities dating back to the Human Genome uh, Initiative and rolling forward to present. The, the My constituents, I would be much more supportive of allowing that if we were included in the profit sharing in some fashion of the that results from the commercialization of our contributions uh, to those efforts. That's the bottom line I hear most frequently. Let, let me add a comment that a colleague of mine who specialized in, in LC uh, in pharma um, uh, told me that I, I, I got to think about it too. Uh, she said that there are some professional societies of a particular kind of cancer, for example, that um, receive royalties from the, the sale of a medication that was um, developed with their cohorts. But the, the debate in the also community is that uh, there, were, there is a conflict there because the higher cost the medication is, the higher price it is, the better it is for that very community, right? And that's certainly something none of us wants for prices to be higher. So, so I think, uh, Sometimes uh, it's hard to to judge what what's really the the best way to approach it. Excellent, thank you. Other uh, comments or questions? I I don't see anything new, Sharna. If you could scroll to the bottom, I don't know if there's something different. Okay. Um, oh, there's a question regarding consent. Is consent required for linkage? The three major questions that are usually asked are like, can we, can we share your data? And this is from an individual research study. Can we share your data with a pharma school company or a for-profit company? Uh, as Lucio was just talking about. Another one is then, can we share it with other researchers? And then uh, a third one is usually genetic specifically. Can we share your genetic information? At least that's uh, in many of the cohort studies that, that we work with. Those are the three primary ones that IRBs are, are wanting to see uh, inserted. So the one about linkage would be kind of embedded in the, can we share your data with other researchers outside of this particular study? Excellent. Uh, and not a specific um, question about linkage consent, at least my perspective. Excellent, thank you. Uh, we have about eight minutes left. Um, we, to your point about uh, knowing how amazing people are, our, our moderators and uh, co-chairs for today graciously added another five minutes to our session. So I thank you for that. Uh, there was a question around the area deprivation index, ADI. Um, Sharna, if you could go up one more. Uh, Mike, I think you made reference to the ADI. This is a public, uh, tool in the spirit of data democratization that uh, Dr. Amy Kind has uh, generously shared. Can you discuss ways it can be used in a discriminatory manner? Well, there's an interesting question. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> there are likely ways that uh, humans being what they are. <laughs> um, but I would say uh, at, from, a, from a strictly informational standpoint, the ADI works on census blocks so you basically put the census block in there and it gives you a number, which is a kind of a percentile measure of how deprived the area is that the census block uh, is, is, is in. So it, I guess if you've got a hold of that and uh, tried to use it, I'm not used to thinking about how I would try to use something in a discriminatory manner. I'm used to thinking of the opposite. Um, here it's used as a way to try to uh, recover some of the information and not be from say race or ethnicity, but from place. The race versus place papers are, are you know, prolific. So that's why it was designed for, to try to help with some of the neighborhood level uh, SDOH kind of things. Um, uh, I'm, I'm blanking for, they may think, they, the person who wrote this question may have a very specific thing they're thinking of, but uh, Patricia, I, I don't know uh, um, off the top of my head how I would, so use it to discriminate. <laughs> well, that's good to know. You use your powers for good, not evil. Good to know. We try. Uh, I want to move to this question here that is asking around limitations of allowing patients to register. 
to study for um, studies on demand rather than blanket permissions for research? Are there limitations that one might need to be cognizant of? Well, I know we're in the process through one of our NIH funded studies of uh, establishing an uh, ADRD registry for American Indian people living in the uh, Northern Plains area. And uh, the purpose of it is to establish a registry that will then um, allow us to um, uh, seek to reconsent and re-invite individuals from that registry to participate on other studies. I assume that's what's meant on demand. And um, I will tell you, I don't, it, I, I think the on-demand approach, it reaffirms the trust uh, relationship between the uh, group that stewards the registry um, and uh, keeps the scientists honest, frankly, and it keeps the local stakeholder communities better informed than is other than the case. And I think uh, just blanket permissions for research have historically been so often abused with respect to marginalized communities. I gave two examples at the outside of my remarks um, that um, we we don't um, we don't subscribe to blanket permissions for research. Um, we really do take honestly the fact that these studies on demand are important to those processes. Now the limitations are the resource intensive. Uh, they require extra Herculean efforts to stay abreast and in communication with the prospective study participants, but I believe that it's um, a better way to go all around. Yeah, I would add that to the extent that blanket permission is linked to trust, and as we heard, uh, certain groups don't have as strong trust, then you would in a way be enriching for the same type of participants that are uh, present and well represented today. Thank you. I want to go back to, there was a question, uh, Charnay, um, that was for Dr. Manson um, that was a little higher up and it had to do with uh, if tribal nations are made aware of who's using their data for what particular research study the results from those studies and what is the situation with other populations and communities? Are they made aware of who uses the data for what? I can't speak la to the last portion of that about other communities, but as perhaps the audience gleaned, the process of codification of these regulatory requirements is moving ahead rapidly in federally recognized tribal communities and others derived from that status so that there are actual uh, contracts, data use agreements, um, oversight uh, requirements, et cetera, et cetera, that address each of these, not only the permission to undertake research, um, but and the resources that would flow to the tribal communities in support of it, but also access to those data for what purposes, under what circumstances, the products that would result, uh, and especially uh, a, a, an authentic attempt on the part of the scientists uh, who lead such research to ensure that the findings make their way back to the community and that they remain engaged with the advocates from those communities and translating the meaning and the utility of those findings to the health and welfare of the communities in question. So those are all codified in the kinds of IRB and community review bodies that are emerging and growing in native communities. Excellent, thank you for sharing. Other comments, Dr. Griswold? I was just gonna say piggybacking uh, on that, I think the use of ecosystems is a, a wonderful way to try to help increase that communication, right? All of those sites that I had in my slides that you go click on, many of them have like, who is using this data and for what purposes? You can click on a state and see all the uh, investigators who have requested data and for what projects they're working on. So you could imagine like specifics for that, for okay, here's an AN, AI community tool that allows uh, an interactive plot to say like, here's everybody who has requested and who has uh, used your data for publications and to get grant funding. And that would be a, a lovely way to try to, to um, use the ecosystem as a tool for good. Tool for good. We are approaching our final minute for this segment. Are there any closing comments or remarks you'd like to impart with the audience 
Um, and Sharnay, if you could scroll down, I want to make sure we don't miss any key questions. There's a question. Oh, here's a question around diverse cohorts. Do we have in the AD, ADRD data systems? People want to know who's there. And I would have been, uh, I would have loved to be able to answer that question. But as <laughs> per my slides, the information is not transparent. That's that was the whole point of uh, us being a community of researchers who works with the computer scientists who are creating these uh, data ecosystems. Right? They they think of uh, they think of the 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 data elements as being FASTQ files with, uh, with your phenotypes is just like a metadata. It's like, okay, what grant did it come from? And was it a female or a male, right? It's not the act, they don't consider it as an actual person an actual uh, uh, information to, to use like we usually would be able to say. So the jury's out on that. But again, I think this is the starting place. We, we didn't have these ecosystems 20 years ago. It was a not even a twinkle in somebody's eye. So now our job, I think this committee's job is to work with the other committees, the other sessions that we've seen here and have them be intentional about including diversity metrics and, and, and uh, transparent visualizations on their pages. Hopefully that message will come through. Excellent, and we are at time and uh, you hit the nail right on the head. Intentionality is essential and very much in partnership and keeping with uh, promoting transparency. As we said at the top of the this segment of the agenda, um, healthy is essential, but so are uh, keeping a watchful eye and being intentional in promoting diversity, equity, inclusion, and accessibility in our research activities. I give a huge thank you to each and every one of you. You've been an absolute pleasure to work with, and I appreciate all the questions that have emanated from your presentations. And I will now turn over to our co-chairs to close us out. Thank you so much. And if you don't mind, I'm going to share my screen. At least I'm going to attempt to do so. Hopefully I won't go away in the process. So just bear with me one second. Can you all see this? Yes. yes. Oh, that's a... Remarkable outcome. Um, so I'm just going to go through a few slides that um, Laura and I attempted to put together on the fly to capture um, what we heard. And I have to say that this, this workshop, this half day of workshop has affected me significantly because it's made me realize that there's many issues that we're so far down in the weeds as computer scientists and data scientists that we're not necessarily thinking about all of the perspectives, which of course is one of the things that we talked about today. And, and so it, I, I think it is highly likely to, to have a, a, a large impact because there was some take home messages that I heard loud and clear that I could see how valued it would be. So the first, uh, talk with um, uh, Dr. Gregoric and and subsequently um, the keynote speaker, I was struck by the fact that we've come a long way in a relatively short time. And, and Susan is still looking forward to what's going to happen next. Um, and in many ways, it's a good was a good juxtaposition between her forward-looking view of the interesting things that we can do as we accommodate new data ent entities like the human pan genome, as well as new analytical approaches like large language models, we have a very significant opportunity to make a difference in how these ecosystems, how the ecosystem of ecosystems um, can, can evolve. And I think that's, a, that's a, something that we really want to think about carefully and, and intentionally. Um, we have fortunately been very um, thoughtful about creating modular community-focused, open, and standards-based systems that can be federated and they can be reused. And we're in the process of demonstrating how to do that first at all, and then in the future, hopefully much more easily. And Warren and some others who have been on various review groups um, know well how challenging that has been in many of the cases in, in the systems that I've been involved in. 
And then I heard loud and clear from those two talks that we have to make sure that we focus on the researchers as users and the, the research opportunities that they wish to unlock. And therefore we can help them unlock those opportunities. And we're gonna to need to be um, continuing to have discussions around user personas, which happens almost every meeting that I, that I attend. Um, the NIH ecosystems, um, they're developing in parallel. So we're all learning together in parallel and we're at various states of various pieces of our ecosystem. So that's made it very hard to track the data availability across all of the ecosystems. And I think that complexity is a consequence of the size of the shift of going from you know, a small group or a singleton researcher who collects some data his or herself and then uses it with his or her graduate student and then produces a paper to being part of this ecosystem where you have to really think about what you're doing in a quite a different way. And it, the questions that come to mind early in the process are, are, are quite complex. So we need to figure out how to make sure that we <clears throat> educate our users and ourselves. We have to think about data harmonization and the prioritization of those resources to use for harmonization. I'll come back to that later. And we need to transition hopefully quickly from downloaders to clouders. I just made up the name, but I think that it's uh, it's worth thinking about that we this is a shift and we need to recognize that it's, um, it's a shift that causes angst in many cases. Um, Good questions about federated versus centralized. I think about this, this is the kind of thing I worry about at night, weren't wondering whether the attack service on a, on a federated system is more or less uh, uh, important than having everything in one place, which is itself of a vulnerability. And it is an optimization problem. And luckily NIH has allowed a number of different models to evolve. And I think that's uh, gonna be helpful in the long run, although we'll have to do some strategizing about how we bring them into some degree of harmony in the long run. Um, how do we strike a balance between no harmonization and perfect harmonization? I heard that loud and clear that we can't extend an infinite amount of resources. Um, I also really like the idea of returning the harmonized data back to the, to the original sources, but that does, I think, require that we think seriously about versioning, which is not an easy problem of, you know, how, who's done what to this original data set? That's something that in some of the grants that I'm working on, not grants, OTAs, uh, <clears throat> uh, that is getting serious discussion and it's just not an easy problem. And then finally, great question. If I have a hypothesis, which data and tools should I use? I don't think we've even begun to think about that problem in a productive way. Again, these are my personal opinions. This is just stands observing the, the discussion today, not anything for NIH's, um, you know, this is not an official. Um, I, couldn't agree more on in the ELSI data sharing um, discussions. It was really insightful. Um, I always knew a diverse workforce had many advantages, but hearing it um, specified very crisply that it's the multiple perspectives that lead you to a higher degree of success. You get a higher quality of science. You establish trust and this trust process is something that I'm gonna have to think about tonight and maybe I'll have a little bit more to say about it to kick things off tomorrow. But it's certainly not an act, it's not a passive process, it's an active process. So being able to have diversity play into your strategy or your strategy playing into the fact that diversity is obviously valued um, is something we have to do thoughtfully and it's a, it's a, it's a team sport. Um, I learned a whole lot from the you know, brief discussion about the tribal communities. That was incredible. I can't wait to get the slides and think about them more. Nothing about us with us. And um, I was struck by a personal anecdote that I won't repeat here, but how the erosion of trust made a big difference during the pandemic and who was be being vaccinated and who wasn't. So that really touched my heart. And then the organizational differences, that was really, really a good discussion because it, I, I didn't think about how the different organizational groups had evolved over time and what they valued as far as decision-making or political differences and the cultural differences. So that was very insightful and uh, uh, awakening to me. Um, De-identification, uh, Lucille did a great job of talking about the various options for clinical data sharing, uh, the uniqueness not guaranteeing privacy, and she enumerated a number of mitigation strategies in a very elegant slide deck that I will have to go back and look at carefully because a lot of those mechanisms I understood uh, slightly differently than she presented. And I thought the way she presented it made it much more clear than I had thought of. 
And then the DEI and ecosystems, boy, that was really impactful. Um, and um, one of the uh, ecosystems, or actually multiple of the ecosystems, uh, are ones that I work on. And the fact that you couldn't find anything about the patients that are actually in there without some struggling made me go, oh, we better fix that. And so balancing the individual and the collective information is, is obviously something we have to do a better job of, that that transparency requires um, accessibility. And then I really got the message loud and clear that we need to be able to tell people whether or not they see themselves in a particular study. And so we have to be intentional about inclusivity and it's clear that we're not doing at least a good job in some of the clinical work. And so um, one of the things that I put in at the very end of my little section, and I'll turn it over to Laura, is that the feedback on the ecosystem examples that you're seeing here today, we would welcome that feedback, even if it is critical feedback that we're falling down on X, Y, or Z, because that way we can learn from our interactions with you all, uh, the, you know, our colleagues and our community members, and we need to be made aware of the things that we should be fixing. With that, I'll turn it over to Laura. Thanks. Lots of food for thought there. Um, and tonight, as you're going about your lives and making your dinner and walking your dogs, I'd like you to start to think about what we're um, setting up for tomorrow. So today we talked a lot about the broader NIH ecosystem, lots of examples um, across that. And tomorrow we're gonna turn our focus and our lens um, more closely into the AD and ADRD ecosystem, uh, the one that's funded and managed by the NIA. So we'll start by uh, getting a, a perspective overview of the multiple repositories and platforms and components that make up that data ecosystem. And then we're gonna shift to working sessions where you'll be divided into five groups who will take a particular lens at highlighting what the opportunities are for the ADRD ecosystem. Um, and it's really important here that we, we identify what challenges we may have, but we also start to think through solutions. What do we need to build to get from today to tomorrow? And where do we wanna be five years from now? Um, can you go to the next slide, please? And we wanted to uh, give you two driving use cases that could be used to um, as tangible uh, instances of what we might build for tomorrow, right? Obviously, we've heard loud and clear all day today that we need to be thinking about building our data infrastructure to support the research goals of the community. And so we've intentionally provided uh, two distinct use cases. The first one, identifying the impact of sex differences on brain aging and AD, ADRD, which may be very well served by bringing data together across the multiple data resources within the NIA ecosystem. And the second, understanding the molecular processes that underlie healthy versus pathological aging um, and mechanisms of resilience to AD and ADRD, which may actually indeed require analysis of data more broadly across the whole NIH ecosystem and beyond. So um, please consider this frame as you're moving forward, reflecting on what you've heard today is going on around us and starting to hone in on, on, on the question of the NIA data ecosystem tomorrow. With that, I, I'd like to thank you all for your time. I think we start at the same time tomorrow. Let me just confirm. Yep. Um, and we look forward to seeing you all there. Thank you.